One of the seemingly most fundamental laws in biology is that a species will produce offspring that are also members of that same species. However, another seemingly fundamental law in biology is that there are very often exceptions to each law. In a truly shocking new paper in the journal Nature, scientists have published a discovery that completely upends this basic biological assumption. A harvest ant species found in Europe called Mesor ibericus has been documented laying eggs that hatch into a different ant species. This other species, Mesor structa, diverged from Mesor ibericus more than 5 million years ago, so these are not particularly closely related species. And yet, this new research shows that Mesor ibericus queens are producing offspring that genetically and anatomically belong to this entirely separate ant species. Some insect species produce offspring that vary greatly in appearance from their mothers, sometimes influenced by the season, population density or social caste of the mother and offspring. However, despite these differences in form, the offspring are always genetically part of the same species. This is not the case with these Mesor ibericus queens though. They're undoubtedly not the same species, and it appears that the queens are cloning males of Mesor structa, then mating with these clones to produce hybrids which function as worker ants for the colony. Although it sounds like a science fiction story, and indeed I have been thinking that this could be a brilliant basis for a fictional alien reproductive cycle, this bizarre phenomenon of cross-species cloning is very much a reality. Scientists began to investigate these ants' unusual cloning habits after it was noticed that there were regions of Europe where Mesor structure colonies do not occur, and yet there are colonies of Mesor ibericus containing hybrid workers present in such areas. This was particularly apparent on the Italian island of Sicily. The biologists confirmed that Mesor structure colonies are entirely absent from the island, and yet Mesor ibericus colonies containing hybrid worker ants can be found here. Somehow, despite the lack of Mesor structure colonies, the Mesor ibericus queens had a supply of the other species' males to mate with in order to produce the hybrid worker caste. Taking a closer look at the structure of the ibericus colonies, the scientists found populations of two very distinct types of non-hybrid male ants living within them. Around 56% of the sampled males were nearly hairless, whereas the other 44% had a dense coat of hair. The nuclear genomes of these different male morphs were examined and found to perfectly correspond to the different ant species. The hairy males all belonged to Mesor ibericus, while the hairless forms had genomes matching Mesor structure. However, no Mesor structure females were present in the colonies at all, and so the only way these males could have been produced is if they hatched from eggs laid by Mesor ibericus queens. To fully confirm that it is definitely the ibericus queens that were producing these structural males, the researchers investigated several lines of evidence. First of all, they sequenced the mitochondrial genomes of the male ants, in addition to their nuclear genomes. The mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, as I'm sure you all know, contain separate genomes from the nucleus of the cell, and this mitochondrial genetic material is always inherited from an organism's mother only. So, what did they find with the harvester ants? The mesor structure males have mitochondrial genomes matching their mesor ibericus nestmates, even though their nuclear genomes belong to a different species. Furthermore, they looked at the genetics of Mesor structure males in colonies belonging to their own species, and did not find such a nuclear mitochondrial genome mismatch in these individuals. So this is a condition that's unique to the structure males inhabiting Ibericus colonies. A second line of evidence involved genetic testing of eggs and larvae of Mesor Ibericus colonies raised in labs, which revealed that 11.5% of the eggs laid had nuclear genomes matching Mesor structure. To check it was definitely the queens and not the non-hybrid workers producing a different species, they then isolated 16 queens and tested the genomes of the eggs these individuals made, again finding that 9% had structure DNA. In contrast, the workers produced eggs that were 100% Ibericus individuals. Their third line of evidence was direct observation of the two different species emerging from eggs laid by Ibericus queens. They monitored a lab colony containing a single Ibericus queen for 18 months, surveying their offspring regularly, and observed reproductive adult males of both Mesor ibericus and Mesor structure hatching from eggs laid by the queen. It's hard to overstate just how extraordinary this discovery really is. These ants have essentially domesticated the genome of this other species, co-opting the structure males into their life cycle and maintaining them as a lineage of clones within their own colony, 
rather than taking them from the wild, thus allowing Mesoibericus to expand its range to regions where Mesostructa does not naturally occur. So what exactly is the precise system at play here? How are the queens cloning these males, and how did such an unusual reproductive cycle evolve in the first place? The process would have started in regions where the two ant species do naturally coexist, and the Ibericus queens had access to a supply of Structor males. For one reason or another, Mesor Ibericus would have lost the ability to produce worker ants by themselves, and would have started to rely on the sperm of another species to produce the worker cast, in this case Mesor Structor. This situation, known as obligate sperm parasitism, actually occurs in a few different harvest ant species, and so is not that unusual by itself. However, relying on another species to make the hybrid workers restricts obligate sperm parasites because they cannot spread beyond where the other species naturally occurs. That's where Mesor Ibericus has the advantage. By producing the males of the other species within their own colonies, there's nothing holding them back from moving into new areas. This ultimately means that the Queen Ibericus ants can produce four different types of offspring. The first kind is made when they lay an unfertilized egg, which is not fertilized by any sperm from a male. Instead, the offspring develops via parthenogenesis, producing an Ibericus male that has only one set of chromosomes, which they got from their mother. The second kind occurs when an Ibericus queen egg is fertilized by an Ibericus male. This fertilized egg, with its two sets of chromosomes, one from the mother and one from the father, will develop into a new Ibericus queen. So far, so good. But then the Mesor structure males come along. With eggs fertilized by these males, one of two things can happen. Either a hybrid worker is produced when the chromosomes from the mother and father are both kept, or the set of chromosomes received from the mother, the queen, is removed from the nucleus. In this second scenario, only the set of chromosomes from the structural male is retained in the nucleus, and therefore the offspring is essentially a clone of the male. The exact way in which the mother's DNA ends up being absent from the nucleus is not yet known, but such a phenomenon has also been shown to occur in some plants and clams. It might be that the males fertilize an egg that does not yet have a nucleus, or that the maternal genome is eliminated from the nucleus after fertilization. The researchers suggest the new term xenoparity to describe this type of life cycle for female ants, from xeno meaning strange or alien, and parity meaning produce or give birth a very good name to describe such a mind-blowing way of reproducing. Another interesting little detail is that the cloned structure males kept within the Ibericus nests actually look slightly different from the wild-type structure males, most notably in how hairy they are, as the wild versions are covered with a denser layer of hairs. It's not clear if this loss of hair in the clones is due to some incompatibility between the mismatched mitochondrial and nuclear genomes, or if it's maybe something to do with how they are reared within the other species' nests. The researchers also considered whether the clonal males could break free from their seemingly domesticated state. They examined the genomes of several more mesostructor individuals to find any evidence of hybrids between the clones and wild-type ants. However, they found no proof of interbreeding, indicating that, for now, the clones are unable to escape their domestication through mating with wild members of their species. This also raises the intriguing question of whether the isolation of these domesticated, cloned lineages from their wild populations could mean that they need to be classified as a different species, much like how we classify organisms domesticated by humans as separate species from their wild relatives. Although the authors describe the males as having been domesticated, they also note that the relationship between these ants is more intimate and more integrated than human-driven domestication, since both members are reliant on the other to complete their reproduction and have utterly intertwined their life cycles. For the moment, all the genetic evidence presented in this paper supports grouping the cloned lineage with Mesor Structor. However, this whole reproductive method really seems to challenge our ideas about how we define a species. The cloned males may appear to be members of Mesor Structor based on their nuclear DNA, but they carry the mitochondrial genomes of Mesor Ibericus. So can they really be classed as Mesor Structor? They even physically look different to standard Structor males with their reduced hairiness. Okay, so say we don't classify them as true members of Mesor Structor then. Are they a new species formed from the hybridization of Structor and Ibericus? Well, not really. True hybrids between species usually have combined nuclear genomes inherited from both parent species, but these ants only have structured DNA in their nuclei. 
plus a hybrid species should be able to mate with other members of that same hybrid species to reproduce. However, with these ants, the only way the Structor males can create offspring of their same species is by mating with an Ibericus queen. Therefore, they are reliant on another species to reproduce themselves. It seems as though these ants are a truly special case among multicellular animals, and I suppose it remains to be seen if the cloned males end up getting classified as something unique. But in the end, the name of a species is simply a human label. And if the case of the clone structure ants tells us anything, it's that a simple human label is often insufficient to properly describe the complexity and blurred boundaries found within nature. An interesting comparison made by the authors is to the phenomenon of endosymbiosis in cells, which is how eukaryotic cells acquired mitochondria. Billions of years ago, the ancestors of mitochondria were free-living bacteria that were absorbed by another cell and co-opted as energy-providing organelles. Therefore, the authors suggest, the clonal males could be regarded as organelles at the superorganism level, distinct entities that have become domesticated and continue to have their alien genomes replicated, as they now play a crucial role within the larger system. This discovery is truly one of the most remarkable biological finds in recent years, beautifully illustrating the complexity of the natural world and highlighting a brilliant evolutionary solution that has enabled these ants to extend beyond the confines of another species' geographical range. As I said before, it really does sound like a sci-fi scenario, and it has definitely broadened my mind to the possibilities of how other species might reproduce. It's easy to get lost in a very human-centric view of the world, and indeed the larger universe, but the incredible lives of organisms such as ants show us just how diverse and creative life on our planet truly is. I hope you've enjoyed this 7 Days of Science special report all about this bizarre story of ant cloning. Let me know in the comments what you think about this fantastic new discovery, and please do tell me if you like this special feature, and if you want more videos profiling new finds like this. Be sure to email us at 7 dosstories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show as well. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.